and welcome to the What Are You Telling Us Forum. My name is Tanya Ha. I'm a science journalist and sustainability researcher and I'm thrilled to be your host for today's forum. The What Are You Telling Us Forum is part of a suite of online forums that will be held over the coming months as part of the Bushfire CRC Research to Drive Change project. Now some of you will have seen the Bushfire CRC's past webinars in which bushfire researchers have presented their findings. This is now our fourth forum style webinar. This new webcasting platform allows us to be more interactive than a traditional webinar. There's going to be online polls, the opportunity for questions and discussion, as well as the core presentations from researchers. Now for a brief overview of today's forum. The focus is on effective communication with communities to aid bushfire preparedness and response. We'll soon start with an introductory video followed by a research presentation and discussion with a lead end user. Along the way, there'll be online polls and opportunities for discussion. Now, for those of you who are new to this online platform, I'll quickly introduce you to this online environment that we find ourselves in. The main parts are self-explanatory. The presenter slideshows and polls will appear in the main panel that you see in the center of the screen. The presenters, as you can see, will appear to the right-hand side of the screen via webcam. But importantly, on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see that at the bottom of the screen, there's a dialogue box. Now, this is a place where you can type in your questions and comments as the researchers present their work. So it's a small window with a speech bubble at its top left corner. So as we progress through today's proceedings, please do send us through your comments and your questions for the researchers and lead end user. Now one thing to note is that our voices are coming today via phone lines and the vision is coming via internet. Now we do this for optimal clarity without putting too much demand on bandwidth, but it does mean that for some of you, depending on your internet connection, what you see and what you hear may be slightly out of sync. That's just part of the web environment, please do bear with us. But if anyone is experiencing other technical difficulties, you can contact the hotline on 1-800-733 416, that's 1800 733 416 and tech support will assist. Now today's forum will be recorded and it will be available on the Bushfire CRC website in a few days time. So if you do have colleagues that you think would have benefited from today's research presentations and the discussion, please do let them know to visit online at a later date. Our last research to drive change forum on shared responsibility in bushfire management is also now online. Thanks to everyone who sent through questions ahead for today's presenters. We did have a lot of questions sent through, so we'll endeavour to get through um, as many of those as possible during today's proceedings. Now, to kick off proceedings, it's my great pleasure to introduce who we'll be hearing from today. We're going to hear research presented by Professor Ian Fairbrother. He's from RMIT University. And we're also going to hear from a lead end user, John Schäubler from Emergency Management Victoria. But first, to kick off this feel of being interactive, we're going to start with an online poll. So you'll see a poll here on the screen. How much do you think you understand about effective communication in bushfire risk communities? So click on number one if you feel you know nothing, number two for a little, three for a fair bit, and four for a lot. And we'll give you a few seconds more. Okay, it's, it's good to see it's all grouped around the middle of the bell curve. So it seems that there's a lot of interest and understanding out there of the importance of communication. We're going to revisit that poll later on today and see if you change your mind. But before we kick off and hear from our presenters, we're going to hear from a, sh a short video that the Bushfire CRC has produced. Now this will provide an overview of the research undertaken into effective strategies for communication in bushfire risk communities, as well as understanding the ways communities respond to risk. And it contains interviews with the researcher and lead end user that you'll hear from today. It runs for around about five minutes. And also, if you do have any trouble seeing the video, you will be able to watch it online at the Bushfire CRC website at a later date. So don't, don't stress too much, bear with us and we'll give a recap at the end of the video. So, hope you enjoy the video.
smoke, so yeah, never mind. The need arises from um, better understanding how to communicate with different communities during emergencies. And so, you know, up until this research, the, the common approach was a sort of broad brush. Um, here are the messages, this is what we want you to do. Um, and it was delivered in a generic fashion, so without, without you know, being tailored to specific groups or or individuals. We were listening to the ABC trying to get, get the reports and that, but then we just heard this roar out the back. We just, we just had to go, we ran. There is an uneasy relationship between information provided and what people do. So that creates a puzzle. And the puzzle is what is actually happening in the locality? What's happening in terms of what's defined as community? Uh, how do people get together and then what is the relationship between people, residents, people who work in localities and the agencies. The feedback came from um, communities themselves mostly and also via um, inquiries and boards that looked at disasters and emergencies and said you know how can we how can you better tell people what's going on, inform them, uh, understand what they need to know. Our research shows that many in localities are somewhat sceptical of advice that comes from remote or distant areas. Um, we also can show that often people look to their immediate reference points within the locality for information rather than, for example, the fire agencies or the emergency agencies, which we actually may know in a more profound sense what's actually happening. My mate has been begging me to get out of here, so we got to have to get out. Dangerous. The complexity and the ways in which localities um, organise and operate is part of the difficulty that agencies face. It's not that agencies necessarily are providing wrong information. Agencies provide correct information in terms of the understanding of the emergency or in the understanding of how we prepare. Our argument is that localities are diverse. They're diverse in all sorts of ways. They're diverse in terms of gender and gender relationships. They're diverse in terms of age. They're diverse in terms of class. Who has um, uh, the capacity to act and who doesn't have the capacity to act. I yelled out to Melinda to take her baby and threw some stuff in the car, get out, and we were grabbing what we could with clothes and then we realised there's no keys to a truck. So I shoot down to her house, which is in, which is in town come back through the smoke and fire so we could start this truck up and wait for me mate and, and followed him out. Did you think that you might not get back out? I had, because I couldn't see and we had to follow both sides, I thought if the tyres burn I was going to keep driving and see what I could. I had no idea, we had no idea that we were in so much danger. Now we need to understand all those things in order to develop appropriate interactive strategies. What is the target? What is the audience? Who are the audiences? What is the complexity in the locality? And how, under in those circumstances, can we construct uh, an appropriate form of communication, both in the immediate sense, in terms of warnings, and in the long-term sense, in terms of education? How can we create that situation so that there is an interactive process between us and the localities? Understanding what makes up the community and understanding that within that community there is a there is a range of other communities, and within those communities there's a range of other communities as well. So understanding that tiered approach is going to be really important, and this research will will help us to better understand that and better develop messaging and information. And thank you to the Bushfire CRC for that video. And incidentally, uh, other research projects and the videos that accompany those are available online at the Bushfire CRC website. They're well worth having a look at because they are great videos that sum up a lot of research in a very engaging way. But for those of you who had any trouble viewing that, I'll just recap the key points from that video that was just screened. Firstly, that in the past, the approach has been for mass media, broad communication, 
without necessarily tailoring much to individual audiences, communities and individuals. The research has also talked about the importance of localities, um, not necessarily centralised agencies as a source of information, and that localities are diverse in terms of things like age, gender, socio-demographic groups or class, and also the capacity for people to act or the incapacity to act. We also need to understand and develop interactive strategies that help people receive warnings in an immediate case, but also for long-term education as well. And again, if you had any trouble viewing that video, it can be viewed online at a later date. This now brings me to hear from our researcher. It gives me great pleasure to welcome to the screen Professor Peter Fairbrother from RMRT University, and he'll be presenting his research on bushfire communication. Take it away, Peter. Thank you very much, uh, Tanya, uh, and thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, our research focused on the information material provided by agencies and the implications of that. Um, there, it has been shown in research that there's a relatively weak relationship between providing information and actually acting, and that creates a problem. We have little knowledge of uh, what, what is disseminated, how it is learned, how it is acted upon. And that's really the focus of the research that um, we did. We want to understand communication and we want to understand communication in relation to communities. And communities not necessarily as uniform, but communities as multiple publics. And I'll explain that as we go, go through. And out of that, we want to shape and develop some of the communication strategies. And we're doing it in the long term, not just in terms of uh, actual events, but in terms of preparation for bushfire events, bushfire disasters. Now, what are the challenges? The challenges that we identified are as follows. There's a question of diversity. So we need to understand communities. I'll say a little bit more about what we mean by communities, but it's important that we understand the complexity of communities. The second thing that we think is very important is to look at localities and to look at the populations in localities in terms of not only individuals, which is often the case that research uh, locks into, but also in terms of households and the social groupings that make up Locality. And thirdly, and obviously, we need to think about agencies, the role and place of agencies, those people in agencies who are living within localities or communities, and the agencies that are more remote and more distant. So we need to understand the complexity of agencies, the number of agencies, and it may vary from one place to another. Now, what did we do? Uh, we looked at four states. We looked at uh, New South Wales, Victoria, Western Australia and Tasmania. We looked within those four states at three locality types. We looked at rural settings. We looked at sea change, tree change types of environments. And we looked at peri-urban environments. We classified localities in terms of that to draw a contrast, to understand the variations that exist. We interviewed directly 336 people. We extended that with focus groups. We did comprehensive policy analysis and documentary analysis. So we have a fairly extensive uh, database that we can draw our analysis on and we can develop our understandings. What I'm going to do is to take you through three sets of issues that came out which are important and which are uh, complicated. The first of all is community. Uh, in Australia, we use the term community in all sorts of ways. We use it tightly in some instances and we use it quite loosely. Um, but there are three broad meanings of community. One is a geographical meaning. Uh, that is a group of people who live or work or reside in a locality, a geographical base. And this often is the way in which agencies look at the term community and indeed um, uh, others in the society. A second way is that a community comprises those who have a sense of belonging. You belong to a group. You belong to a locality. You have a 
a shared sense of being in that area. And thirdly is an issue around uh, social networks. How and under what circumstances do we combine together? And I'll say a little bit more about that because social networks can be actually quite um, complicated. So it's the web of social connections that define a locality or a shared sense of uh, belonging. So let's go a little bit further. This is really to give you a flavour of the type of research we did, which was very detailed, uh, what in the scientific language is called ethnographic type of research. We interviewed people, we observed in localities, we talked and reflected. And here we see um, a, a situation where this, these two particular interviewers, uh, uh, interviewees are saying uh, something quite uh, strong. In the first instance, that's a person who has a strong sense of identity, a strong, strong sense of where the area is. Um, and um, there's also a, 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 an implication in the second uh, 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 quote of exchange. We share information. And sometimes that can be tricky. We can actually draw boundaries between those of us that are old, have been here a long time, those of us are new or, uh, uh, or different or, or relatively recent. And that uh, complicates the picture of, uh, of community. Um, another set of um, uh, quotes that have a, an implication of the other, uh, the riffraff we get in the town. So the other, not us, but somebody else. We need to think of these sorts of um, comments because the really central point that comes out of it, the strong point, is that we often live in diverse social settings. We often have complex understandings of what constitutes a community and how we develop understanding about where we live and indeed what we do uh, and indeed the social groups of which we're part. Now, as researchers, we've got to take that into account. Otherwise, we tend to simplify and over um, overstate the characteristics of community. Second major issue is social networks. What are they? Social networks are webs of relationships, how we know each other. Families may constitute a social network. Friendship groupings may co constitute a social network. The links and in involvement that we have in schools and elsewhere may also constitute a network. We may have a network in terms of us as people in a locality and the brigade, the CFA brigade or the fire emergency brigade in, in other states. So that becomes a complication. There are three types of issues that we need to ponder when we look at social networks. They're not simple and they're not straightforward. The first is bonding, the relationships between people, um, how those relationships develop. The second is a question of bridging. How do you establish and promote the connections? And who does that? In our research, the people that did the bridging were often key people within a locality or key people within a group that constituted uh, a way of dealing with bushfire or indeed preparing for bushfire. And the linking is a way in which we talk about the relationships between a group and external agencies, a group of people looking at bushfire preparation and the agencies involved. And those links can be quite complicated. So all I'm doing in, in pointing that out to you is pointing to the complications that we need to take into account when we talk about um, social networks. And here we find a social network or a lack thereof where um, a, a, an individual, and it highlights what this does, is highlight the problem of vulnerability. And it also points out the links between not only those that do the door knocking, but the community services and community support. And so we're talking about, can we build a network? Can we build a network that involves that particular person that is discussed? And the final thing that I want to draw attention to is the way in which gender matters. Now, when we began the research four years ago, gender was not a, a major focus. What happened is in the course of our research, in the course of our interviews, in the course of our observation, it became apparent to us that gender was very important. We need to think about gender. 
We need to understand how and under what circumstances we deal and address issues perhaps differently in terms of our experience as men and others' experience as women. And out of this comes this uh, clumsy title or clumsy term, hegemonic masculinity. And it's very important to understand that, not in its detail, but to understand that masculinity in this instance doesn't refer to men. It refers to the types of relationships that often characterize the relationships between men, men and women. And we need to understand how some of those uh, relationships put men in a particular place in society and women in another. And hence we have difficulties. Difficulties can come out of the ways in which we look at the world differently. It's not to say that one is necessarily right or wrong. It's to, it's to say that we need to develop a prism whereby we look at some of these issues. And here we have an example, an example of how that can play out in practice, whereby we have a couple and they're talking about do they stay or go? And Tom, the man, has a particular opinion. And his opinion is he will stay or we all stay. And if he stays and we all don't stay, then the wife and the children will go, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a particular way of shaping the ways in which we look. And the point of actually noting this is we need to keep these sorts of issues and these sorts of uh, questions in mind when we're actually looking at communication, when we're looking at the basis of effective communication, because these are the prisons, these are the social relationships whereby we hear, whereby we understand, both in the long term and in the short term. So when we're preparing in the long term, we need to keep these things in mind, how we focus messages, how we uh, develop messages and understandings. On the other hand, these issues also play out in the immediate. And we have had quite um, tragic comments in the Royal Commission about some of the ways in which these things actually play out in practice. So what do we need to remember? We need to remember that gender matters, as does ethnicity, as does age, as does whether we're young or old, as does whether we have the resources, wealth, whether we have the resources to act or not act. So by looking at gender matters, we open up a whole range of issues. We have multiple communication strategies. Why? Because audiences are diverse. So as agents, we have to think about that audience. And for the agencies, understanding communities, understanding the complexity of communities opens up a challenging, a difficult, but over time manageable and, and very positive set of development. So what do we need to consider? What do we walk or what need to walk away and remember? We need to think about the concept of community, and I've tried to explain and show how that is complex. We need to look at diversity, and we need to look at difference. And we need to be aware that we are different and we are, do live in diverse communities, and one and communities and organizations and networks, and one is not necessarily better or worse than another. And that draws our attention to the relationship between agencies and communities. And it also points out to us, our research points out to us, the things that we need to know further. We need to look at the practice of the community engagement. We need to focus very much, not as it came out when we did our research and we realized that gender and gender relationships were important. We now know that gender is important, age is important. Wealth is important, ethnicity is important, language is important, and we need to understand how and under what circumstances we develop communication strategies, both in the short term and the long term in relation to that. On gender and bushfire, until now, there have been very few, in fact, only two peer-based um, um, uh, reports in journals, academic journals, in Australia on gender and bushfire. That is an astonishing uh, piece of data. In other words, it hasn't been the focus of research and it's important that we do that. Thirdly, as I pointed out in social networks, social networks are very complicated. We need to understand in terms of bonding, in terms of bridging, 
in terms of linking how we build social networks and the complications of that. And finally, and this would be follow-on research because we were looking at the long term, the preparation, with some reference to the immediate, but we need both in the immediate and the long term to look at all sorts of modes of communication. For example, social media and what the complications are. For example, word of mouth. For example, a fact that came out in our research that people in geographic localities tend to rely on the immediate and not the distant. They will listen to the ABC, but they also take more note of the neighbour, the friend, the relative. And that's an important thing for us to consider and agencies are wrestling with these problems. So modes of communication become one of the difficulties and one of the challenges, but nevertheless one of the opportunities that come out of this particular research. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Now it's time for you guys to send through your questions that you might have for Peter about his research. And if you do have some questions or comments, again, do type them into the dialogue box that's at the bottom left-hand side of your screen. Um, as Robin has already, and Robin will get to the question you've sent through um, a bit later on when we have um, John on screen to talk from the perspective of a lead end user. Uh, but Peter, the first question I wanted to ask is about the research challenges that you set out to address and specifically we've seen a lot of market research out there like the, the classic evaluation that's done at the end of an education campaign is market research, where did people get their information on, how effective was it and so on. What else do you bring to this as a sociologist that market research doesn't necessarily bring to the table? Tanya, let me begin by saying that market research is important and it has its place. Uh, but one of the, uh, the things that not only as a sociologist do I bring to the table, but obviously as a person who's employed within a university with the support and the facilities and structures associated with it. In other words, we are able to develop long-term, very detailed pieces of research. We, um, in terms of our initial analysis and looking at the question of effective communication, we addressed the issue of how and under what circumstances do we understand community? And what is the relationship between agencies and communities? And we felt, we took the decision that this required detailed long-term research. Developing data, re recording data from a whole range of uh, sources, involving through focus groups and discussions, feedback and interactive relationships. It's our task to assess that in information, to classify it, to analyze it, both in terms of conventional structures and software developments that have taken place recently, to classify and then out of that develop understandings. And then to put those understandings into the public domain. And that's what I hope I've done. I'm not making a claim that I know absolutely the right thing from the wrong thing. But what I am saying is that I can develop a, an understanding and interpretation which is based in a particular, understand, uh, a particular piece of research over a long period of time and I can put that into the public domain so that we can learn from it, discuss, develop out of it. Yes, I think understanding is the key word in many ways, isn't it? Yes. Uh, Cormac has sent through a question. Um, how do you, oops, sorry, I've just, how do you see um, you for your speech and presentation. My question is, what impact does the bushfire? Oh, sorry, now I've got. Ah, yep. Yeah. How do you see generational changes in terms of communicating with communities, particularly for communities affected by bush? Sorry, affected by tree. <laughs> affected by tree changes and sea changes. Sorry for my little technical hiccups there. No, no thank you very much. Um, that's a very important question and um, we did um, uh, open this uh, issue up in a variety of ways and this uh, material is in the uh, major report. Um, clearly there are differences between young and, and, and elderly. Um, the young, for example, have a much greater and higher facility uh, with certain aspects of social media. They also may not have the same sort of connections and involvement in localities. The, uh, older generations may have been there for some time or indeed in tree change and sea change um, situations may have retired to an area 
uh, for very specific and very positive reasons. And indeed, in some instances, as we our report shows, bring with them an understanding of the environment and the preparation that sometimes the more established people don't have. And it can work in the other way. Sometimes people can come from urban backgrounds and uh, need to go through a learning process. Uh, our, uh, what, there are two things that come out of the research. First of all, when we're welcoming and um, uh, getting to know people who move in uh, and who are in different generational settings, we need to reach out. The young need to reach out to the older, the older need to reach the younger, the new to the those more long established and vice versa. And we need to be uh, understanding and accommodating because we won't always have the same understanding, uh, but we can learn. Uh, the second thing is, and which is very interesting and you can see it in the research, we do some very uh, detailed analyses of how social networks build up. And in the cases that we worked on, which was in Tasmania, the people who develop the bonding part of uh, the um, bridging part of social networks got the networks together, set the parameters, discussed and were energetic, in general were older women. And that was a very interesting finding. Now, we can note that, um, and it's very interesting. Uh, we can't say a lot about it because it requires now further research, but we were able to trace out in that the texture and the ligaments of building uh, uh, networks and, and that had a generational aspect to it. How did you find um, instances, say, where the, you know, the part-time tree change or the part-time sea change, because for many people bushfire season coincides with summer holidays, so some of the people you're wanting to uh, reach out to might live during the year in urban cities rather than in this particular locality. Was, was that a challenge? That was, a, that was a major challenge, not, not so much in contacting uh, people and for us to do the research. We've got the data on it, but the major challenge is contact and contact between agencies and these people and between local brigades and these, these people that come in for a very set uh, period of time and indeed older residents with newer residents. Um, that's a challenge. That's one of the things that we need in future research to look at absolutely specifically. Our research identified that there's a very major issue in this particular space. I have a question that Jeff has sent through before the event. What is the most successful means of identifying trusted networks of people of influence in communities, particularly smaller isolated communities, both during and after an incident? Yes, that's a very interesting question because one of the things that came out um, and we uh, there's some additional research that we have done prior to and complementing the research we did for the CRC bushfire which was about the community fire guard process that's uh, evident in um, Victoria but has its equivalents in Tasmania and South Australia in particular. Um, we um, to identify the uh, uh, concrete ongoing uh, social networks, often they have to be built around, some, uh, around other things than just bushfire. And in some of the communities, we, uh, we saw networks developing around, for example, sports facilities and um, health facilities and indeed schools and indeed roads in a particular area, but they require work. They require people to have commitment and this is where the bridging becomes very important. We also need within those, and it can be a changing uh, personnel, but we do need people who have time and can put e effort and energy into simply talking to each other, simply mm -hmm. sending out, let's have a meeting. We haven't had a meeting for two, two months. We need to actually think about it. The fire season is coming, let's reflect. And we do get instances which is, uh, refers to the isolation and re isolated and remote. We do unfortunately have instances where people will categorically say, I'm not going to actually belong to this group. I've, moved, I've had one interview which I remember very clearly said, I moved here for a very good reason. I didn't want to actually mix with people. So Challenging. Yeah. And actually, it relates to um, the things you've raised relate to a question that Deb had sent through. Does your research provide evidence of the link between risk communication and ed education in peacetime, so to speak? 
um, and a person's ability to respond to warnings during an emergency. Yes, uh, that's very interesting because uh, our focus is on the long term and the preparation and the preparation then for the event. And we use education in that context because we think education is very important and we've got lots of data to support that, not just with, in relation to bushfire but other areas of activity. For example, health campaigns are also campaigns around health. We need to understand our health issues in order to actually begin to address them. In principle, that's not really very different from uh, disaster preparation and bushfire preparation. And we would argue that education is, should be an ongoing set of activities within or directed towards communities, partly from, perhaps from agencies specifically, as happens in some states, uh, perhaps uh, linking into schooling and other resources. Uh, uh, it's got uh, implications for time and, and whatever. We do see that as very important. And we do see also, and it's terribly important, and I know there have been some questions about this, what happens in an event, um, how do we actually handle and develop an event uh, in relation to an event. We've got, we know that, uh, and there's been a disaster, what do we do afterwards? We need also, in terms of education, to be able to reflect in a sympathetic, empathetic, but quite rigorous way to draw lessons and indeed to act on those lessons for ourselves uh, so that we do have in, 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 um, uh, very strong evidence where people don't draw up plans, then they're less well prepared. We know that from events, we know from after the events, these are the sorts of things in an educational setting and an educational understanding that we can begin to promote. We've got a couple more questions, but we'll need to keep the answers fairly quick. Um, this one that Tim sent in, um, what have the research found to be the most effective mechanisms to facilitate the public's willingness to change, particularly in relation to um, timescales from when the message is heard, digested and acted on? Uh, the, the, the most, the most uh, important thing to do is to recognise that there's no one silver bullet. We need to work on this over a long period of time and we need to target audiences in terms of the diversity and we need to explore different modes of communication from education to an announcement. Um, there is no quick silver bullet. We need to actually recognise that there's a complex situation. So I guess in terms of effectiveness, it's, it's horses for courses in some ways, isn't it? Indeed. Um, this question from Emma, um, how much does the bushfire impact um, impact people in terms of monetary loss and their ability to recover? Well, uh, again, very important question. Uh, it's terribly diverse and it's very uneven. Um, property, you know, as we all know, is affected. People lose their lives. Um, the impact in terms of loss, both personal and monetary and whatever, is quite drastic and there are figures available to actually systematically show that. Uh, but we do need, to, we know bushfires are disasters, we know bushfires are dangerous, and we know people are impacted upon it. Um, what we've got to do then is talk in terms of that complexity. Well, that's what we've got time for for now. Thank you for that, Peter. Uh, we'll hear from Peter again a bit later when he rejoins the discussion at the end of the forum. Now we're going to do another quick online poll just to see how you think you might use the things that you've learned today. So the poll will appear on the screen and in this case you can tick more than one answer if you so choose. So in which ways would you begin to use what you've heard today? Would you share and discuss with colleagues and stakeholders? Would you use the findings to inform policy and practice in your organisation? Would it be useful to advocate for more resources for community education and communications within your organisation? Or will you learn more about this research by visiting the website at bushfirecrc.com? And we're just asking you to give us a sense of how you'll use it. We're not asking you to make a, a firm commitment. And a few more seconds. And we'll leave it there. 
So from the looks of it, there's a, a good bit of information, learning and dissemination. The interest is, is there, which is good to see. And it now gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Our lead end user is John Schäubler. He's from Emergency Management Victoria. Welcome, John. Now, can we start off by getting you to introduce yourself, um, tell us a little bit about your role and also how this research we've heard about today is relevant for your work as a lead end user? Thanks, Tanya, and hello, everybody. Um, my role within Emergency Management Victoria is as a strategic uh, advisor to the Commissioner. Um, and some of the work we are now involved in is trying to refocus um, Victorians, in this, in this case, on um, fire safety, uh, development of policy that applies across a range of uh, activity, including shelter uh, and community warnings. Um, and so this research for us is, uh, is a pretty pivotal piece of work, which is why we're more than happy to be the lead end user. We have had some questions sent through already, so I think we might just dive straight into them. Um, one that Drew has sent through, are processes to routinely collect data on the responses of communities to bushfire incidents being considered? Um, I'm not quite sure what Drew means by data here, but, but if he's talking about active collection of data of incidents that are going on, well, there's some, some of that is now happening. Um, we routinely go and, and, and communicate with uh, affected communities after an event uh, and, and do a lot of work in terms of trying to understand what we could do better. Um, and so you will have seen over the past three or four years some improvements to the way in which the, 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 the technical ways in which we spread data to the community or, or information to the community. So some of the things that Peter talked about earlier, the importance of understanding those social networks that are already in place in communities, understanding the influence that gender has on the way people use this information and learn and make their plans. Has that had an influence on the work that you're doing? I'm sorry, Daniel, I was just distracted because the lights went out in this room and so I don't know if you can still see. <laughs> I can still see you, yes, you're still looking good. <laughs> so just give me the hard point of that question again. Yeah, so we're relating back to the research that Peter's presented, you know, particularly um, the nuance around the importance of understanding the social networks that are already in place, you know, who are the people who connect communities and get information out, and also the things that Peter had talked about with regard to, to gender. Uh, does this inform the, the work that you're already doing? Absolutely. The, 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 there are some key things that have come out of this research from our perspective. Uh, gender is one of them. There, I guess there are things that we, we, we had gut feelings about, and so a lot of the, the approaches in, in communication up until now have been based on sort of on feelings rather than hard research and that's why this is such an important piece of work. Excuse me, John, uh, can I get you to speak up a little bit? We're having a little bit of trouble hearing you. Um, so that's better, thanks. Uh, I was simply saying that, that, that often it's about what we've we've reacted with, you know, to gut reactions or almost gut feelings about about how we should communicate with communities. And, and the research is, is substantial in the sense that it tells us a lot of things that we assumed. Now, mm. now in a sense, there's, not, there's nothing that, that's revolutionary, but it gives some real um, substance to the, to the view. It, in a sense, it's sort of some new things such as uh, the nuances of communities, the use of trusted networks. These are all things that we have not been, as agency, terribly good at doing. In the past, we've taken a very broad brush approach to messaging. Uh, we've, we've made assumptions about what people understand, we've made assumptions about literacy, we've made assumptions about education and wealth. And so there have been very few instances that I can recall where, where communication has been targeted to particularly to, to segments of, of communities, to particular groups within communities. Uh, Peter mentioned uh, the, way, the different ways in which young people and older people um, uh, acquire information, use information, understand information. Uh, that's been that's emerged in particularly in the last few years. That, that younger people in particular have always been a very difficult group within uh, our community to get to with messages about bushfires. And when you look at affected communities after an event, it's the young people that are most severely affected because, in a sense, you know, where is bushfire on their radar? It's just not there. 
Actually, that leads very nicely into the next question, which is one that John has sent through, but it also picks up on a question that Cathy has asked. Um, as social media activity increases, which you know, stereotypically the young folk like to use their social media, but also it's very useful for, for niche communication. As social media activity increases, should fire agencies be focusing resources into this kind of two-way communication? Well, they already are, and pretty much in every uh, jurisdiction that I'm aware of, um, it, that, that two-way dialogue um, has become a significant part of, of uh, fire season activity. Uh, and it extends to other hazards as well. So in relation to flood, I mean, some of the, the great learnings in Australia came out of the, the Brisbane floods in terms of the use of social media, particularly Twitter. Um, I guess there's a trap there. There's a, bit, there's a word of warning around, around social media, and that is that it, it, it can get clogged up with a lot of irrelevant stuff. You can actually you can up in a, end up in a situation where the, the information that's being spread via social media is not accurate and frankly not helpful. So, so moderating that is difficult, and and agencies have actually, uh, in some instances, gone straight in and gone in pretty hard in terms of themselves becoming an active social media user, um, and that encourages a, a, an informed dialogue, and that's important, and that that I think is here to stay for mm. as long as those means of communication remain popular. Robin sent through a question earlier. Um, agencies often do not have local information in sufficient detail compared to those um, who are there. For example, inaccurate GIS data on minor roads. Um, what are your views on this? I mean, I saw that question and it's, it's, um, it's a really good one because uh, local, all disasters, emergencies, whatever, are local. Um, and so, you know, if there's a fault on the part of agencies is that they'll send in people from outside, very skilled, highly, um, um, are, you know, highly experienced in their field, but who lack local knowledge. It's about connecting local knowledge and people who have local knowledge with those those management authorities. So, you know, in the warning context, uh, to say there's a big fire burning towards uh, a, a big town is actually quite meaningless. And so, the more refined, the more uh, directed, the more relevant and tailored that information can be, uh, the better. You only get that through using local sources of information. The agencies are actually quite good at using local knowledge for their own purposes, so in a, in a combative sense, but when it comes to actually communicating with communities, they're not always switched on. So that's an area that needs to be developed. Mm. So developing that information exchange, so almost like a, a telephone exchange evolves. Uh, I'll now bring Peter back into the discussion. So um, the audience, this is your last chance to send through some questions before we wrap up. Um, but I have a question here from Loriana. Um, so either John or Peter, if you'd like to answer, what measurements can be used to understand how effectively you have communicated to communities at risk? Um, let me just say something briefly. I mean, it's very hard to develop a concrete form of measurement. But I, for me, the baseline is a disaster survival, a disaster minimising loss and property loss, a disaster uh, people are prepared. Um, and it's a matter of working those sorts of things uh, out. And over time, uh, we think that if we develop um, comprehensive communication strategies, then, and people in all walks of life enter those situations more prepared and having thought about it, then that's the appropriate measurement. Did you have anything to add to that, John? Uh, it, it's difficult. Measuring things is difficult in the, in the emergency management context. I mean, um, I recall Peter saying that that you know survival and not losing houses is actually a really good measurement, and that, it's true. But it's it's you know it's, it's difficult to measure in this space. Um, you know, the traditional measures of bums on seats at meetings, that sort of thing, don't really reflect uh, outcomes. They reflect, it's an accounting measure. It's not actually something that tells you whether your communications have been effective, uh, whether people have internalised information, whether they're going to act upon the information. So, so measures that, that, 
that reflect actions and outcomes are important. I don't think we're, we're there yet. I don't think we've developed them. We've got a question that Tan sent through. Hi, Tan. Um, Peter, your description of distant communities take notice of nearby sources of information rather than from afar, agencies and so on. Where and how do, you, do local brigades feature and what are the implications in carrying responsibility for information provision? Meanwhile, on the day of the fire, brigade needs to be out fighting fires. <laughs> a very good question. Um, and uh, in a sense, what it points to quite dramatically is the short term and the long term. Uh, brigades are part of the locality uh, geographically. Brigades will be locked into the social networks and the types of relationships that uh, are around that. And indeed, brigades should be the vehicle of information and discussion and debate and reflection. But on the day of the fire, they might be somewhere else. They may be allocated somewhere else. So it's important that we actually anticipate that. And it's important that when we're de developing communication strategies, they're developed on the assumption that that is likely to be the case. Uh, Tanya, could I just weigh in here? Yeah, um, sure. As a, as a fire brigade person, as a <laughs> long -time firefighter, I mean, the reality is that um, local fire brigades become hubs of information. So, you know, you look at any, any recent large bushfire, people, people invariably go to the local fire station seeking, actively seeking information. So, so smart brigades actually factor this into their, their, uh, their planning and so that there will be, not everyone gets onto the truck and drives away, but there'll be someone at the fire station who can provide uh, local information that's uh, as good as you're likely to get. Now, you know, in some, some locations, there's enough people to do that. In other locations, it's going to be trickier. But, but you know, it, you talked about local networks, trusted local people. Uh, there's, there's absolutely no question that there's a role for for brigades to uh, to play in that space. We have a question that Lauren had sent through, which actually touches on very similar things. But I'll read it out, and if there's any nuance in there that you want to add to, then do. Um, if we know that people source both local sources of information and talk to locally trusted people, how can we incorporate this into our preparedness activities and support these unofficial communication channels? Oh, I, I think, uh, as, as you say, it's a very important question. I think that's really the focus of, of the long term. We need to be aware of, of that. We need to understand that in practice, there is a relationship between local, lo being locally based and local information, be it from a brigade or a relative or, or whatever, and there is a role and part to play in that process by agencies. We need to work that out over time before the events, uh, not during the events. And John, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, I guess that's happening to a certain degree already. Some of the programs focus on on using local network or building local networks to, to spread information around. It doesn't have to be high tech. Uh, it can be quite simple. It can be about using telephone. It can be word of mouth. Uh, the, the, the essence of it is to get information into those little hubs, if you like, that's uh, useful, tailored, accurate, um, and, and worthwhile. I mean, there's, there's not much point in you having a local network that, that doesn't actually know what it's doing or know what it's talking about or add value to the discussion. So there's a place for both. There's a place for both uh, top-down information and information that's come from the ground. Thank you guys. Now before we get you to give us your closing wrap up comments, we're going to revisit that first poll that we had today. So we'll have that appear on screen. So let us know how much do you think you understand about effective communication in bushfire risk communities? One for nothing, two a little, three a fair bit, four a lot. Uh, it's always nice when we put up these polls to see the, the shift of the bell curve go towards the bottom, towards more knowledge. And we'll leave a few, few more seconds there. And we'll wrap up the poll there. 
Thanks for your responses and questions to the audience. Um, before we conclude, I'd like to give um, Peter first and then John an opportunity to give us just your closing comments, any feedback on the poll results and any take home message that you'd like to leave with the audience. Peter? Um, thank you. I thought the um, questions were really insightful because they pointed to the difficulties that we actually have. And as John said, many of these issues um, were assumed. We've now got data that complicates and substantiates some of those things. If I can just say, I think there are three broad issues that we need to keep in uh, mind uh, all the time. The term community is complicated. And it's not just geographical. It's not just locality. It plays out socially, because we, are, we live in social settings. And we need to think about those social settings. And out of that, come quite complicated processes of building social networks. I would guess that one of the research, urgent research areas is to understand how social networks are built, the complications of them, and how they're maintained and survived. So that's the first point. The second really is about diversity and difference. And that came up in the questions. It came up in our research. And we need to ask questions about gender. We need to ask questions about age, about wealth. Uh, about ethnicity, about language, and we do need to understand some of the difficulties and how in complicated ways people will draw upon it. And it's the newcomers and the long established people. How do you learn when you go into a community? Um, what is the process? Are the old established ways appropriate or do we need to, to learn? So diversity and difference and us learning from each other. And the final thing and the challenging issue um, agencies are good. Agencies do wonderful things. Uh, but agencies need to remember the community. The community needs to remember the agencies. And from what it's worth, um, we've opened up those sets of issues. I think the next stage is to try and understand the conditions for two-way interactive engagement. So it's not just a top-down. And indeed, it's not just a bottom-up. It's that all of us learning from each other uh, over time and in relation to these sorts of events. So it's not just isolated objects in organisations, it's relationships. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Peter. And John, as a lead end user, you get final say. Uh, that's good. Agencies are good, Peter. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> I guess you know, this is leading us to a, a different space as, as policy setters and as agencies. Um, because it's giving it, it's put a lot of meat on the bones of what we understand by community. And as Peter said, there are communities, and there are communities within communities, and there are communities within the communities within the communities. So, so understanding what that means um, uh, is important for us. Um, in the past, there's been a tendency to talk about the community. Now there is no such thing. So that's the first thing. That the, the nuanced messaging is going to be the next big challenge for agencies. So the, the targeted messaging that. that that takes into consideration um, those factors we've talked about, those demographic factors we've talked about, um, education, wealth, um, um, gender, uh, and gender is fascinating. I mean, gen gender is about decision making as much as anything. It's not, it's, you know, it's not to say that, 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 that messages are understood differently by gender, but the actual decision making process is the important thing, uh, and that there are there is some firm evidence that that that's affected by whether you're a man or a woman. So that's the second thing. So, so uh, the, and the third challenge for us is to actually put some of this stuff into policy. So, so how do we develop public policy around uh, bushfire communication that acknowledges all of this, uh, this new learning? And that, that will keep us busy probably for many years. <laughs> Thank you, John. Well, that brings today's forum to a close. Thank you to the presenters, Peter and John, for their insights, and of course to you, the audience, for your participation and questions. Now, we encourage everyone to visit the website at bushfirecrc.com, where in the coming days we'll make today's forum and presentations and video available online. Um, related reports and fire notes can also be found on the website. Do encourage your colleagues that you think might have benefited from today's proceedings to visit the website, to log on at a later date and to watch the forum. And also we have a brief exit survey. We'd really appreciate it if you could take the time to provide us with feedback so that we can improve future forums.
Our next webinar will be Living on the Edge on understanding the risks and lifestyle benefits of living at the urban-rural interface and this will take place on August the 11th. So keep an eye on the Bushfire CRC website for details or leave a comment in the exit survey if you'd like to be included in the mailing list for future online forums. Now on behalf of the Bushfire CRC Research to Drive Change project and its partners, thanks for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time.